This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. This is a uh, meeting, a regular meeting of the Finance Committee and a special meeting of the Town Council on February 16, 2021. Uh, and uh, it's two o'clock, which was the posted time for the meeting. And uh, this is a virtual meeting pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order to send certain provisions of the open meeting law, general law, chapter 38, section 18. This meeting of the committee and the council is being conducted by so I'm going to do in just a moment is um, ask each member of the finance committee if they can um, hear the presentation and if they can um, in turn um, if uh, by their response we will know that they are able to, we can hear them um, when I have done that, I'm going to turn it briefly over to President Griesmer, who's going to um, then uh, make sure that the uh, council meeting is called to order appropriately and that uh, she can confirm members of the council who have not already confirmed their presence uh, through uh, the finance committee. So. Having said that, uh, I'm going to uh, see Dorothy Pam. Are you present today? I am totally present. Okay, Kathy Shane. Yes, here. And Lynn Griesmer. Present. And Pat DeAngelis. Pat, you're here. Present. Are you, you're muted, so we're, we haven't confirmed. Um, I'm not. Oh, great. Thank you. Bob Hegner? <laughs> well, I am present. <laughs> I'm, I'm here. Well, we heard you. Uh, Bob Hegner? I'm here. And Bernie Kubiak? Good afternoon. Okay, so I think that... Oh, and Jane Scheffler. Uh, Jane, I see you're here now, too. So I, um, we need you to confirm, uh, to unmute and confirm so that you can confirm your uh, attendance at the meeting. We just okay. lost We just lost her. Yeah. I'll let Athena see if she can uh, address that issue. And why don't you pick up on the uh, Lynn as council president? Okay. Uh, so I would like to confirm the following. Alyssa Brewer. Present. Mandy Jo Haneke. Present. George Ryan. Present. Sarah Schwartz. Present. And then I'm calling the town council uh, committee of the whole meeting to order at two zero two zero four. Back hey, to you. So, shall I go back? Yep, you, your turn. Um, so, um, first of all, I want to just briefly uh, preview today's meeting, and then um, we will be on our way. Uh, the goal of this meeting um, is really defined by the town council when it passed um, a uh, provision that require, uh, that uh, has the council wanting to have a plan for funding of the renovation or expansion or replacement of an elementary school in accordance with Fort River MSBA grant application, the repair renovation expansion of Jones Library, the replacement of the Central Fire Station, the replacement of the Department of Public Works headquarters consistent with an October 21, 2019 council vote that is the sense of the council that it is committed to a plan 
that will address all four buildings in some fashion. And um, so we had asked um, our finance director, Mr. Mangano, and our um, town manager to make a presentation to the finance committee and the council um, about um, a plan that would um, allow for that to happen. So um, we've called both meetings to order. Um, I'm going to, um, in a moment, ask Paul to introduce the presentation that uh, Sean is principally making. Um, and the presentation uh, is, is the core of the meeting. This is a meeting of the finance committees and uh, a regular meeting. And we are, according to council rules, have posted this also for public comment. So I'm gonna to come to that in a moment. But after the presentation, it is my intention to recognize members of the council and the finance committee so that's the counselors who are present resident members of the finance committee who can ask questions um, and uh, Mr. Mangano will uh, either choose to respond to them as they come or take a group of questions and respond to a group of questions so that's um, something that I've left to him. I will be recognizing anybody from that group that I've to find counselors plus resident members of the finance committee in the order that people raise their hands. Um, I am not going to try and distinguish. So it's uh, just an order of uh, raised hands that I will do recognition. Um, if at the end of that period, then I will open it up to public comment. Uh, public comment, and I will say this again later, is for comment, not for questions. Um, if um, somebody's comment is I, that this information as they identify it will be helpful, um, that is something that uh, we will be able to respond to at a later time. And uh, so that's basically what the plan is for today's meeting. And uh, with that, uh, I think I will turn this over to our town manager and ask uh, him Andy, to... Andy yes. Jane was able to reconnect. Can we click quickly confirm that she can hear? Oh. Heard? Let's see, Jane, could you uh, just confirm your, your attendance? I'm here. Okay, Thank you. great. Thank you. Uh, so, Mr. Bockelman, some to you. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Andy, and thank you, Lynn. Um, so I'm joined here today by um, our finance director, Sean Mangano, our comptroller, Sonia Aldridge, and our financial advisor, David Eisenthal, who's been advising the town on borrowing and other financial matters for decades. David, you'll have to say when, when you get to speak, you know, what, how long you've been with the town. So I know it's been a long time. Um, this is a project we've been at for a long time. We've put a lot of time into it and credit uh, Sean for bringing it all together in the presentation that we're about to give you today. Um, I wanna thank you for your time. Um, the council has some really significant decisions concerning the town's infrastructure and finances and your decisions will influence what the town looks like and how it's managed for decades into the future. You have important decisions in front of you. You can go to the next slide. So there's four key points we want to make today, but we're going to get into a lot more detail in a second. So first, I think we all are in agreement that the town's infrastructure needs considerable investment now. It's been three decades since the town constructed a new building. Our current buildings are showing their age, and for many, if not all of them, renovation is not a good or financially sound option. Second, the town council asked me for a plan to do all four capital projects. The finance director Mangano will show you that we have the financial capacity to take on all four projects during the next few years with two conditions. First, that the town voters exclude the debt from a new school building from the limits of Prop 2.5, an and override. And second, that we have established and observe firm budgets for each of the projects. Third, in making your decision, 
the council and the public need to understand that while we have the financial capacity and resources to take on these four projects, there are consequences to your decision. Taking on this debt will limit the operating and capital budgets going forward. There are things that we may want to do in the future that we will simply not be able to afford because of these decisions. And that's okay, we can manage within that, but I just wanna make sure that, and Sonia and Sean and I all believe strongly that the council needs to be, to be fully informed on the content of your decision. And lastly though, on a positive note, and I know the town council knows this, but I think it's really important for the public to be aware that the town's finances are very strong. And David can attest to this if we ask him. The, the fact was confirmed by the town's auditor who just presented the town's audit to the town council. We have strong reserves. We have declining debt, virtually nil at this point in time. Uh, we are addressing our long-term liabilities like OPEB and pension. And we'll be continue to elbow out room in our annual budget to accommodate the debt payments that we see going forward. So I'm now gonna turn it over to Sean, who will lead you through our presentation, which will discuss things like our guiding principles of financial, the, he'll show you the financial model, talk about public engagement and the key decisions that the council will be facing. So Sean. Sean, before you, you uh, start, uh, uh, Lynn, there are two members of the council who have joined since you confirmed uh, participation, I think that Councillor DeMont and Paul Milne are both present now. Yes, I'd like to you need to confirm that. There. Councillor Paul Milne can hear us. And yes, we, I'm here. That Councillor DeMont can hear us and we can hear her. Yes. Go ahead, Darcy. Thank you, Sean. Sorry to interrupt you. No problem. Um, so as Paul said, I'm Sean Angano, Director of Finance for the town. Um, I too want to thank David Eisenthal. He's been a uh, tremendous help. He's been running lots of um, debt schedules, um, adjusting variables as new information comes in. He's, he's one of the most responsive people I've dealt with. He, he gets back very quickly um, and he always follows up on everything. So I just really want to um, thank David for all the work that he's done so far and for the work he'll do in the future because there's a lot more work to be done. Um, so thank you for that. So these are some of the topics we're gonna address today. Uh, we're gonna briefly look at and what Andy already sort of laid out, which is what is the goal or the task that we're trying to address with this presentation. Um, we're gonna look at the stakeholder engagement plan, which has been a primary focus of, of what we wanna do here. We really wanna be intentional about our, our plan for engaging decision makers and the public. And then we'll talk more about that. Um, we wanted to, kind of lay out some of the groundwork or, or working assumptions, which are the guiding principles and the working prerequisites. These are things that everyone should be aware of. Um, they're, you know, it's what the model is based off of. Um, and so again, this is sort of being as transparent as we can. We wanna make sure everyone's fully aware of these things. Uh, we'll look at the financial model. And I don't, I have the tool available, the, the tool that we would share with the public. Um, so at the end, if people want a, a quick, uh, uh, demonstration of that, I can do that. I will just say that the model is at the point where it's beyond the tool in terms of what we're looking at here today. The, the tool has some limitations that, um, you know, we really have to work with our financial advisor, David, and, and, and some other places, um, combining the capital improvement program and things like that. Um, so the model you'll see here today, is it's based off the tool, but it's really been, it goes deeper than that. Um, but I can show what type of um, public engagement tool we could share at the end. Uh, we'll briefly discuss some other factors, which we'll, we'll just kind of, the things that people need to be aware of, um, things that we're thinking about as we put the plan together, uh, but some of them are things we can't control. We just want, want everyone to be aware. Uh, cautionary considerations, these are again what Paul had mentioned earlier, things we want around our debt or potential um, impacts on our operating budgets in the future. Um, we wanna give you an idea of the magnitude um, of what that could look like. And then we'll wrap up with sort of pulling the key decisions together that are in front of you and talking about next steps. So I won't reread this because I think this is essentially what Andy read earlier, but this was the, the, the wording and the goal for the town manager about coming back with a plan for funding um, of the four projects that we're gonna discuss today. And then more recently, uh, there was a memo to provide an updated version of the financial model to determine options of how we move forward. 
Um, and as I said before, just these bullet points, we, we, we use that model to sort of zero in on options that seem feasible. And then we've worked with our financial advisor to develop them as much as we can. Not, you know, the, the library, for example, is much, um, much farther along. So we're able to work much more with the financial advisor to develop uh, financing scenarios for, for that project. So this is our draft plan for stakeholder engagement. And as I mentioned, we're placing a really high priority on this, this uh, for this project. Um, it starts with today, with the presentation at the top. Um, the next thing we plan to do is dedicate a web page or a, a project page using our new Bang the Table software to this project. And essentially that would be a, a, a hub for connecting stakeholders and decision makers with all types of information related to these four projects um, and the financing, more, more specifically the financing of these four projects. It would also be a repository for questions and answers. So questions we get today, questions we get on social media or other places, we would try to list them all there so that we have a running list. Um, we discussed doing like a story map to help people kind of visually come along to see what the buildings look like and, and where we're at in the, in the process. Um, and we would also post the link to the planning tool here. And this is where I wanna also thank our communications manager, Brianna, um, she does a lot of this behind the scenes work. She's uh, really great at it and really helpful at um, working with us to think about how we can best engage the, our stakeholders. And so she would lead a lot of this work. So I, I don't wanna forget to thank her. And she would also help us with the second or the third item on this list, the social media and press, press release and community outreach. She would help lead that initiative of getting the word out that this information is now available. Um, the next one, so because the tool was uh, seemed to have a lot of interest in the past, we were willing to sort of set up some working workshops or some sessions once it's posted and live um, where people can come, we can do some demonstrations, people can ask their questions um, and try to make it as engaging as possible for the public. And then the next one after that, uh, we did this with the budget and it, it seemed to work fairly well. So dedicating a couple of days to really just questions on, on this process um, and, the, and the model and things of that nature um, where we would get questions and try to respond to them in a very timely fashion. Not that we don't always try to do that, but we would try to do it um, you know, within a half hour or an hour or something of, of that nature. Um, so dedicating a few days specifically to that. And those would sort of follow up on those workshops where the tool was being demonstrated. And then we're always available to support district council meetings um, and other groups as needed um, whenever we're asked. And so the, the chart on the right, that um, I just wanted to highlight, that's sort of the model we're following for this process is we're sharing the information out today. This is sort of the, the big first big update in a while. Um, we are then gonna use this plan uh, to engage all of you and the public. And then we will analyze that feedback and refine it. Um, this model is meant to be fluid and, and flexible and, and adapt to um, as variables change or as we get feedback. And so this is, this is the plan we're gonna go forward with. So next we're gonna talk about um, some of the principles that we tried to build into the model or we, we use these when we develop the model. So the first is that it's affordable. And when I say affordable, I don't mean that it's cheap or inexpensive. I, I, mean, I mean that it's sort of based on dependable revenue sources. So when you look at this, it's based on a percentage of property taxes or reserves, or if a debt exclusion um, passes, then that's sort of a known amount. We wanted it to be based on sort of our known revenue sources as best we can. Um, next is to minimize the impact on the taxpayers. Uh, this model only uses one debt exclusion um, and we do try to utilize our reserves to smooth out the peaks and the debt payments uh, when we can. Uh, probably one of the more important elements of the plan is that it, uh, it moves the projects forward um, expeditiously or, or quickly. Um, we wanted to um, kind of be aware that delays could result in higher borrowing costs. Right now, interest rates are are very favorable for the town. And the farther we push these out into the future, and some of these are already you know, four or five years down the road when we would actually borrow for them, um, the farther we push that out, the, the higher the likelihood is that interest rates could rise. And we also wanna be aware 
of you know the potential for sunk maintenance costs if if we delay a project and because of that delay now a, a new roof is needed or a new HVAC HVAC system is needed um, we wanted to try to limit that as much as possible and lastly we all you know we've heard lots about cost escalation and the price of building materials um, and the farther out we push things the the more that could grow and then we'll talk more about this um, later but you know we're Paul and I lately have been spending a lot of time thinking very long term as to like the next round of buildings that might need to be replaced and, and really making sure we're in a position where 20 or 30 years from now, we can take on that next round of buildings, whatever those buildings may be. Uh, we wanted to maintain a focus on asset maintenance, um, and that means having enough funding set aside for all the other non-building project needs, um, for sustainability initiatives, um, for the accessibility repairs that we, we've learned about, for keeping all our other buildings in good working order. Um, we wanted to make sure that there was uh, sufficient funding for those things. And then the last piece, as I mentioned before, we want, the model is meant to be very flexible, respond to, to changing market conditions, anticipated expenses. Um, we want it to be able to adapt. So next are sort of the prerequisites, prerequisites. So Paul mentioned um, one of these already, which is um, it, this model is based on at least one debt exclusion being approved and that one must be the school. And that's primarily because that is the largest. And if that project isn't approved for debt exclusion, um, there wouldn't be enough cash capital funding for the other projects. So that's really a, a must for this. Um, Next, and, and also a very important one, is that the funding of capital must be at 10.5% of the property tax levy for roughly the next decade. And we'll see, I'll, I'll be more specific as to what those look like in different years. Um, but it does mean setting aside a substantial portion of our tax levy for capital, um, which has always been a goal. But if we're going to move forward with this model, we really have to stick to it. And establish funding caps as presented, which we'll see in a, a slide or two for the projects. And so this is around um, setting a number for these projects. And when we work with designers to design these projects, have, have making sure that they have the number in mind of what the town can afford. It's not to say that you know, there's not gonna be more discussion on these, but um, this model, you'll see what the numbers are in this model. Uh, using 4.6 million of reserves. So we've been intentionally building up reserves for a number of years. And I'll give you more information in a few slides about if we were to use this, uh, this dollar amount of reserves, what would that mean for what's left over? Um, and you know, how does that soften the impact on the, the operating budgets and the capital budgets? And, and then the last two are really, again, just more about full disclosure and transparency of making sure that you're all aware of the uh, impact on future operating and capital budgets. And I'll give you a sense of a little bit of what that looks like, and then the impact on the debt load of the town. And I'll share some information with that as, uh, with you um, on that topic as well. So onto the model, these are um, some of the, the basic assumptions. We're, we're coding the model by date for right now, unless we come up with a better coding system. So we'll, we'll use the 21621 as the, the term for this model. And if we do a, you know, refine it, get information and we reshare it, we'll, we'll update the date. So we'll be able to keep track of the different models that have been presented. So at the top, you'll see the different, the four different building projects and the cost of the town. Those are the caps in this model. Um, the library number should be familiar for most people. That's pretty well um, established at this point. Um, the other projects are a combination of looking at um, what projects look like, look like in other towns and what you know, the model could afford essentially. Uh, one of the hardest pieces to sort of predict at this point is the, you know, the approximate project end date um, for all the projects other than the library um, because they're just not far enough along um, to know. Um, so we did do some, make some assumptions here and these could easily um, move forward, but or most likely move backwards farther in time, um, which would push the debt payment out. But this is what we've, this model is, is using at this moment. And then you can see the column, this is where the debt payments would begin. And for some of these projects, such as like the school, there will be multiple borrowings because it's a long, it's a long duration um, for construction. And so it, it'll probably be two or three borrowings as opposed to a single one. 
Then down below, you'll see the borrowing terms and the interest rate and whether or not it's a debt exclusion. So for the projects that are in the near term in terms of when we would go out to borrow, the, the interest rates are lower as we go farther out in time. We're more conservative about what those interest rates would look like. And the only one that's at 20 years right now is the Jones Library. And that's because we have a more developed uh, financing schedule for what that would look like. Um, and, and the interest rates, we have a better sense of where that'll end. Um, my desire would be to try to shorten the borrowing terms for the other projects as well when we get closer to actually going out for them. And if we, you know, if we can get interest rates that are more favorable than what you see here, which uh, we may be able to do, there's the potential that we can shorten those borrowing terms as well um, and trying to keep our you know, annual payment to approximately the same. And then, as I mentioned, the only uh, project at this point that's debt excluded is the new school. So uh, this model assumes a percentage of the levy allocated to capital will be 10% in FY23 and 10.5% in FY24. And then it would stay at 10.5% um, until FY31. And where it would go back, could go back down to 10% or lower. Uh, the total reserves, as I mentioned, is projected at 4.6 million. But it's important to note that this is over seven years. So it's not like that amount would come out all at once. Um, and you know, I did a look back at our reserves um, over the past several years. And I think in the last five or six year uh, span, we added about 7 million to our reserves. So there's the potential that with just what we add to our reserves on an annual basis, because we are conservative in our budgeting, that, the, that we might not have to draw this much out of our actual reserves. Um, but if we did, if we weren't able to put anything back and we, we did have to draw this full 4.6 million out of our reserves, and, and reduce it by that amount, we would still be at about 15, between 15 and 16% um, compared to our FY21 budget, because we don't know what our budget would be seven years from now. Um, but we would still have a, a good safety net is mainly what this is trying to show, um, which will be important for our operating budget in the future. And then lastly, this model assumes a minimum of 2.8 million in cash capital for new projects. So that's above and beyond what's required for, for actual and projected debt. Um, and this number allows us to stay around 6% of the levy for ongoing capital. So 6% would be dedicated purely for the non-building projects, essentially. Um, and then the, the rest of that would go towards these new buildings. So this is the chart that most of you have seen at one point or another um, adapted for these assumptions. So the solid black line is the percentage of the levy allocated to capital. So that's the 10.5% um, beginning in FY24. You can see it ramps up to from where we are today. The dotted black line shows the years where reserves would have to be used. Um, and you can see it's about seven, seven years where that dotted black line comes up to cover the, the bars. And then the bars themselves, the, the green one is our existing debt running off. The yellow bar is how much would be dedicated to ongoing capital. The purple bar is the debt payment for the library. The red bar is the debt payment for the fire station. And the gray bar is the debt payment for the DPW. Um, and so one thing to note for the ongoing capital for at least the next four or five years, we're using actual numbers from our capital improvement program because we're we're farther along in developing that. So um, those 2022, 2023 um, through 2026, that's more based on actual projects that we're aware of at this time. And just a reminder, the schools are not reflected on this chart because uh, the model assumes they would be debt excluded and so they would have their own funding source. So they're not, they wanna be in this comparison to the levy. They would, however, um, be the one that has an impact on property taxes. So this chart um, breaks down the impact of the debt exclusion at different property value levels. So on the left, you'll see uh, property values starting at 250,000, going up to 650. Next to that, you will see the average annual increase to property taxes and then the max annual. And the reason there's a difference is because the debt schedule 
currently um, assume sort of a declining debt payment where it starts out higher and then gets smaller um, over time. And so there's a, you know, the early years is where really the highest, uh, the greatest impact would be, and then it would wind down. Um, but we wanted to give you the average too. And these are estimates. I want to be clear. The, there's a lot of variables here. Um, this is based on our current total taxable property value in town. So if total taxable property values rise through new growth, um, just price increase, uh, um, value increases, then these numbers could drop a little bit. If something happens where total taxable property values drop, then these numbers could increase. So um, these numbers are good for a specific point in time, but as that total taxable property value changes, which it does every year, um, these will, will shift. Um, and the other big variable is, you know, we modeled what we think the, the borrowing could look like for the school project, but that's still quite a few years away to when construction would actually begin. Um, there's MSBA reimbursements involved and the timing of those. And so the, you know, the schedule of borrowing is, is another variable for the schools of what that would actually look like. And we'll be able to adjust this as we get closer to, um, to get a more realistic picture. Um, but this was sort of a, a best guess at this point. And I also, on, on this slide, I just want to thank the assessor's office. Um, they helped uh, put together a lot of these numbers or review these numbers for me. Um, so I don't want to neglect to thank them. So these are some of the other factors I mentioned that I'll just touch on really briefly that are things that are you know sort of always in my mind when I'm thinking about the model. Um, not necessarily things that have a, a right or wrong answer or, or that we really need um, a decision on is just just for you to be aware of. Um, one is the debt financing. That's where I've been working with David and our treasurer quite a bit. Um, there's lots of different things we can do there, and so so he's been a huge help. Um, looking at our reserves and more from the standpoint of making sure that we have a, a strong safety net for our operating budgets, um, especially if we move forward with these four projects, as we said before. That means we'll have to be more disciplined on the operating budget side, and it'll be more important than ever um, to have a strong safety net if something happens. Um, the sort of the interaction of operating versus capital and, you know, that we need to set aside a certain percentage of the levy for capital, and that could have some friction with the operating budget, which we'll, we'll actually look at in a slide or two. Um, flexibility that we can't predict all the variables. There are lots and lots of variables, as you can, you're probably starting to see. Um, but just being aware of them and making sure that the model is flexible to adapt. And then, you know, if all four of these projects move forward, there are, there's the potential for either new revenues or, or cost reductions from several of them that haven't really been factored into the model moving forward. It could either help on the operating budget side or potentially reduce the, bar, the debt. Um, so just to be aware of that. So now we're on to the, cautionary consideration phase of the presentation. Um, you know, the beginning was sort of how we can do it. And this phase of the, the presentation is more about things to keep in mind. And so the first one we wanted to go th run through is sort of a scenario with you is what happens if in the future, the town cannot maintain 10 and a half percent of the, the tax levy for capital. And so at 10% of the levy, uh, the model would be about 2.3 million short um, between FY22 and FY30. At 9%, the model would be about 7.5 million short. So you can see what a big impact um, that percentage has on our ability to, to move forward with these uh, four projects. Um, the 2.3 million at, at the, the first bullet point there, that's probably not a huge deal. If it's spread out over seven or eight years, that's something that I'm sure we could work around. Um, at the 9%, that's where it starts to become more substantial and, and a bigger challenge. Um, and what we would have to do is use some of the strategies listed below to um, address that challenge, essentially. Um, so it could mean allocating less to ongoing capital in some of those years. It could mean allocating less to operating budgets in some of those years, um, using more reserves, or potentially looking at a second debt exclusion. Um, and in reality, it'll probably be a combination of one or two of them. Um, so again, we wanted to just show, illustrate what happens if we can't stick at that 10 and a half percent, you know, what decisions would have to be made in the future because um, 
this is a long-term commitment and it will extend beyond at least your current um, tenure on the council. The next uh, sort of caution we wanted to put out there is sort of focused on that tension between the operating budget and the capital budget. And so we wanted to look at FY, the FY23 budget as an example, because that's where there's sort of the big ramp up from uh, eight and a half percent for capital going up to 10% of the tax levy for capital. And so we, we focus on that year because that's going to be a big shift. And so the first bullet points is just showing if there was a 3% increase in the FY22 budget to get to our new FY23 budget, that would be about a two and a half million uh, dollar increase in the funds we have available. Um, and that 3% is reasonable. Um, it's again, this is just a hypothetical. I'm not, I'm not forecasting that's where it's going to be, but um, it seems reasonable given where we are. Um, if we do that um, and we move forward with this model, which increases capital again from 8.5% to 10% in FY23, um, just the, the increase in the capital will equate to about 1.1 million. So that eats up you know, a big chunk of that 2.5 million of new monies. And so what that would ultimately mean for our operating budgets, once we take into account pension increases and um, state um, assessment increases, is that we would probably be looking at another year for FY23 of between one and one to one and a half percent increases for operating budgets, um, which is similar to where we are now. So again, this isn't a definite or um, again, I'm not forecasting here. I'm just saying this is a, a possible scenario that could happen that would sort of highlights what that tension might be if we move forward with this model. And then the last one is around the last sort of cautionary consideration is around our debt. And so currently a very small slice of our debt goes to um, debt service or a small slice of our general fund budget goes to debt service um, around 2% each year. If uh, during the peak, if this model is, uh, if we move forward with this model, um, during the peak years where the debt payments are the highest, we would be between seven and 8%. And that's from FY26 to FY29. Um, and then looking at outstanding debt as a percentage of EQV or, or total taxable property value, um, we're currently about less than 1% uh, at the moment. As, as you all know, our debt load is very low. Um, however, at the peak, we would be over 3%, which is would be somewhere around FY24 to FY28. And this second comparison, I just want to uh, state that this includes enterprise funds, which recently had some new debt authorized. So this already factors in some of the, the new enterprise fund borrowings as well. So the purpose of this slide isn't um, to scare anyone, but it is to make sure that everyone is sort of fully aware of you know, the impact on the debt of the town uh, when we, if we implement all four of these. Um, however, I, I also wanted to say that not moving forward also has um, negative consequences as well. And, you know, I'll use an example, uh, the most recent example that I was involved in, uh, the school project, for example, if it was um, approved the last time it was in the MSBA process, it would have been substantially less expensive than what we're looking at now. And so delaying does sometimes lead to the projects costing more. Um, the other unintended consequence of, of that project failing is that now it bumps up the school projects, the school project against the DPW and the fire station. So it makes it a much harder um, sort of challenge to take on because now you've got all three of these at once where if it was approved earlier, um, the school might already be on the books and we'd be paying down that debt. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, Paul and I are looking, you know, 20, 20 years, 30 years down the road, um, you know, North Fire Station, the high school, some of these other buildings that are currently around 50 or 60 years old, the more we delay, the more we might bump up the debt from these projects with those projects. Um, and so we just want to, we're trying to be cautious of that and be aware. So on to key decisions. So the big overall decision is whether or not to authorize all four building projects. Um, these other decisions are sort of underneath that, whether to establish project caps, um, how many debt exclusions, how much of your reserves to use, um, what percentage of the levy to commit to capital, and the timing of the projects. And just noting that 
Um, we don't have complete control over the timing of the projects. Um, some of them are either part of grant programs or we're still you know, in expor exploration phases, um, but definitely can influence the timing of these projects. And we've put in you know, the, the assumption that this model uses. So you can see if we move forward with this model, what the answer to these questions are. And so nearing the end of the presentation, we just wanted to um, talk about next steps. So, you know, we'll, we'll incorporate feedback today, but the plan is to move forward with some of the stakeholder engagement activities at the end of the week. Um, there's a there's a presentation to Joan, uh, the Jones Library presentation is next week at the council meeting. Um, and then there's gonna be more information coming up um, on the siting for the fire EMS station and the public works facilities. And I'll also just note as well that the um, preliminary capital improvement program is being presented Tuesday night to JCPC as well. And that we tried to keep these, these two in sync as much as possible, um, the capital improvement program and, and this, uh, this tool. It, it's actually Thursday night. Thursday night, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And with that, I will Good. see if there's any questions. Before we do that, um, could we ask, uh, just put David Eisenthal on the spot, if there's anything you wanted to add after seeing the presentation, David? Thank you, Paul. Through the chairs, I'll say it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I've been working with the town for over 30 years. Uh, I, as a very junior advisor, I assisted with the uh, uh, financing of the police station. Uh, which is now about a 30 year old building. So uh, I do have a long uh, track record with, with the town. I guess the only thing I would say is I think that there is a plan that uh, this plan uh, should, uh, if the town does decide to go ahead with it, 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 is, it does seem to me to be a feasible plan in terms of finances and in terms of uh, how, uh, how the town will uh, cover debt service, I think that it'll, the town will retain uh, efficient and ample access to the capital markets, uh, I believe, uh, uh, with this plan. So, uh, and uh, I can go into more detail if uh, uh, the members uh, have additional questions. So I'll hand it back to the, to the chairs. Okay, so one of the all three of you who've made the presentation, Paul, Sean, and David, um, and for your work in putting this presentation together for us. Um, as I had said at the beginning of the meeting and I'm going to repeat now, um, the next two segments of the meeting are questions uh, from counselors and um, then public comment section follows so that public is aware that there is a public section uh, public comment section um, in the meeting. But during this next session, I am going to be recognizing counselors and finance committees in order that they raise their hand. And I see that um, Lynn has raised her hand. Uh, she's a co-host, so um, it doesn't appear. So um, I will, uh, if anybody from the council or the um, finance committee resident members have questions, um, I'll try and adhere to that order. And I start with Kathy Shane. Kathy. Hi. Um, thank you, Sean and team. Um, this was uh, uh, an all star performance um, with a lot of questions that I might have had um, at least partially answered. So I, I have, um, I didn't have a long time to look at the presentation, but I had a couple questions. Um, going up on the capital uh, to 10%, you show the impact in operating in the year that that happens, FY23. So my question is, what about FY 24, 25, 26? You know, the next five years, when I look at the graphic, these are the years where things are accumulating and we're above, we're, what I think of as above the line and you're drawing down reserves. Um, the what, because um, one, in, just, just my understanding um, 
as we've been looking at the regional school budget, that even if we didn't give wage increases, the step increases alone, if we don't cut staff out or do something about operating or in the 3% range, you know, so one, one to one and a half is really tight. Um, so if, is it one more year of that kind of pain or is it multiple? Um, so, so, so that's the question on how many years out. And if we don't do that, where's the give point? So I didn't know. So my second question is how much flexibility do we have on reserves? It, I think based on what you've told us before on reserves, we've, we've amassed a fair amount um, and the 15 point whatever, 8% that you said we'd be able to maintain, I think is higher than what we have to maintain. So would it be possible to in those tough years to draw down more on that? And what are the limits? Um, you know, is it, you've said a certain amount of reserves, you know, how much more could we do? Um, then can, I just, I'll just list them all. You've got DPW starting soon. Um, and I saw on the um, end chart, you said on February 26th. So I'm not sure what, where that is. We'll have some discussion about sites. So do we have a site? Um, so that's just a question because it can't start before we have a site. So it looks like it's starting and finishing soon as it fire. Um, and then the last is on the library, which is one where we, we have a pretty good sense of the total. We know what we've been told the town tax share would be, but there's a big difference between the two. So a couple questions on the impact, and I know you're going to let us use the model. You know, if if we give a hard number and the library can't do the fundraising they expect to do, and or the total project costs when they actually go through the current cost of construction turns out to be higher than the 36, what do we what do we do? It looks to me like there's not any flexibility in this budget to pay more. So um, how much time do we have to make that decision on the library um, before we have to say yes to the grant sort of on, on knowing what that is. And in the, when we first, if we take on the grant, at least I think the terms of the grant are we, we have to, in the initial years, be paying most, almost all of it because the actual project grant isn't coming in on day one. So if you already built that into the model that there's a, a jump up in year one or two before the building is finished, before we get the grant money. So whatever we're financing, then we get paid it back because of the grant. So it's that the one we have that's the most eminent, you know, if we wanna be super rigid on this, what do we have to do? And I will stop. Those are my three big questions. Impact on capital, on operating. I could see the impact on other capital just from being on the committee. Roads, roads alone start to approach the 2.8 million, but you know, we will be tied on the rest of capital if we can hold it to 2.8, but that's a different question. Thank you. Andy, it's, I'd, I'd probably prefer just to try to answer them as they come in, Okay. if that's okay. Um, so I'll try to take those in reverse order and I'll look to Paul to jump into if he wants to add any. Um, so the library project, my understanding is if that is approved by the council in April, the town will receive its first grant payment in FY21 or, or this fiscal year. And so the model, we're looking at the model a couple of different ways for the library project. One where we use grant monies first and only borrow when we have to and then the flip of that, where we use town money first and, and hold on to the grant monies for the library and try to um, maybe earn some sort of interest on it and use those monies last. Um, and David knows he's, he's ran both options for me very quickly. <laughs> so thank you, David. Um, so, so the sort of more traditional model, I think, would be the first one, which is use the grant monies first. And so if the project is approved in April, um, the town would not have to borrow or, or make a payment on that project for a couple fiscal years. And that'll be talked about more at the um, the library presentation on uh, next Monday. 
the the next one i think was a question on the dpw and the timing i agree that's again the dpw and the fire station the timing is you know one of the biggest variables with those um i know we're moving forward and, and we'll get an update on this soon um about trying to identify a site for the dpw but that is a major variable that could push that project back um the next one you had was on reserves and whether i think um we could use more potentially. Um, ultimately, that would be, you know, we'll be up to the council and, and sort of uh, and the town manager around planning. Um, the 15%, you know, I think our current policy guidelines are keep our reserves between five and 15%. And so it is a little bit above that. However, I will just note that that 15.84 is based on our budget, our FY21 budget. If our budgets keep increasing in the future, that 15.84% might be lower. Um, it might, you know, it won't be hugely lower, but it might be lower uh, below the 15% upper limit that we that the policies set. Um, and then the last one was around um, the, you know, other other years where there could be impact but, uh, or friction between the operating and the capital as we ramp up our capital spending. So FY23, I focused on because that's really our the big jump that, that's going from eight and a half to 10%. Um, after FY23, we have a small jump going from 10 to 10 and a half percent the next fiscal year. And then after that, we stay at 10 and a half percent. So it would just um, go up the same percentage as the property tax levy goes up. So I agree there probably will be some additional years where there could be some friction between the operating budget and the capital. But I suspect FY23 will probably be the, the most significant because that's where we're doing this big gap up to get from eight and a half to 10% um, for capital. And, we're, and our budgets are also, you know, we, we reduced our budgets quite a bit for the um, pandemic, um, being cautious of what the effects could be um, in our local economy. As we start to come out of that, um, we could see maybe larger than normal increases in our uh, in our local receipts section of our budget um, as things start to return to normal. Okay, thank you, Dorothy Pam. Sometimes I have an inconstant signal, so I'm just going to put a, a plug in for town broadband because I have a real hard time keeping this on. Um, my questions are easy. That's a different capital project. Um, <laughs> yes, yes, I, I, it's what I'm very keen on. Um, how much new revenue have you been, did you count on when you put together these numbers? New revenue. So um, the primary new revenue that is baked into this model is in the property tax levy. So it, it assumes um, the annual two and a half percent increase. And then we have a conservative figure for new growth for the next um through the next decade. And then after that, we kind of drop off the new growth piece of it. Um, but it's a, it's a conservative estimate for new growth that we use for our budget each year. So that's the primary source of new revenues other than the debt exclusion itself, which that too would be a new revenue if that's approved. Okay. Um, then where I didn't get, get straight was when would the ribbon cutting ceremonies be? What year of, for these four projects or are some of them 20 years away? I kind of missed where when they actually come on, on into operation. Yeah, offer. so the, you know, these are assumptions that they, they won't be right, um, or not right on, which uh, the library in 20, uh, summer of 2024, um, school mm -hmm. summer of 2026, um, DPW summer of 2023, and the fire station of 2025. Again, those, those will shift uh, based on how construction goes that's, and how- That's very, very moves. soon, that's incredible. Yeah, so that, again, I said, that was one of the key principles of this model was trying to move forward mm -hmm. quickly um, with these. Okay, then the next one was the meeting that we were to hear more about uh, something is that on the 26th of February, but that's a Friday. Is that the right date? So, so that's not a meeting uh, under the council order. I'm, deliver, I'm to deliver you a, a memo or an update on the two on the DPW and fire project by the end of December, okay. end of February. So that's when I need to deliver the project. Okay, so that's like a, maybe a written communication. Would, would that be yes. a written communication you're saying or? Okay, fine. Yes, yes. Um, and so then my last one is, will sidewalks ever figure into this plan? Repairing sidewalks. 
So they mean, are, be yeah. Tight, you know, you mean just generally sidewalks in town? Just generally. Uh, yes. Yeah. I mean, I was just talking to someone who's in this room today about it's we're entering our third year and the sidewalks that I came in discussing from constituent complaints have not been touched. So just wanting to know if sidewalks will ever be in here. It sounds very tight. Very tight. Yeah. So, so they're in here in the sense of trying to maintain, um, a substantial amount of funding for ongoing capital needs. It's so they would come out of that ongoing capital need okay. bucket. Um, and so that's why we're trying to keep that as high as possible. And that's one of the reasons why, quite frankly, we went over the 10% that we, uh, the 10 of 10% of the tax levy for capital, we went to 10 and a half percent was so okay. that we could keep investing in, in this ongoing capital needs. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So I'm going to keep going with, uh, thank you, Sean, for your continuing to respond. Um, I'd said that I was recognizing people in order that they were quite, um, that they show hands on the raised hand function, except that um, Lynn uh, can't raise her hand because she's a co-host. So I'm gonna, she's gonna be after Bob Hegner, who's our next person. So uh, the next two people in order are Bob Hegner and then Lynn, Bob. Thanks, um, thanks. Um... Sean and, uh, and Paul and David, it's a really good presentation and very informative. Um, I had a question about the limits on, you know, the cost limits on each of these projects. Are we going to budget them below that cost limit, understanding that there are always cost overruns or hidden costs, or are we going to budget them at that level? And then what would the impact be of a 10% overrun or a 15% overrun. So I think what we would do is we would budget, budget it at this. Within the project, typically they keep a contingency budget line item in any kind of capital project. So we would expect that the um, contingency would cover any of those cost on overruns. The purpose of this, of this cap is that when the um, committees or the groups that are looking at the design of the building are designing not to a strictly to a program, but also to a number. Uh, and because we need, people need to understand that there's a budget that they have to live within. And it's not going to be everything that we want. And, uh, you know, we're, we already know that our department heads and the people advocating for projects are going to say it's not enough. Um, and we're not going to be able to do everything. And we acknowledge that it's not going to be enough to do everything. So we have to choose the things that we think are most valuable, or maybe we phase it over a longer period of time. Okay, thanks. That's, that's, uh, that's a very sensible approach. Lynn? Um, actually, I'm going to, my first question actually builds on a question Bob just asked, and that was, am I, uh, is my assumption correct? There's usually a 10% contingency in most building budgets, at least mm -hmm. that I've been involved with, that's been, the percentage used. Okay. Yes. Uh, and then um, I'm assuming that the reason we don't want to stretch over more than 20 years or for instance with the library is because we need to be getting this debt paid off to be ready for the next round of buildings that you know some of us might still be here for. Yeah, that's that's one of the reasons. Um, the other reason is just it, you know, it pays off the debt more aggressively. We we put pay less, um, you know, interest costs over the life of the borrowing, um, but also getting it off the books as soon as possible. Um, and then, um, did the number that you used for? I'm I'm sorry to be focusing on DPW and fire, but I spent a lot of years on these two buildings. Um, did the number that you used for the fire? Uh, station, it would be in the south, it would be on the site where DPW is, would it also include the headquarters? So one of the next, um, assuming we move forward with this, one of the next big pieces that we need to do is, is re-engage the designers for these projects with these numbers, and then see what we can get. So I think it's hard to say at this point until we do that, um, you know, in particular for the DPW and the fire station. Mm -hmm. And then um, in all of these, um, I'm assuming you may give me the same answer, but we're, how have we accommodated for the net zero bylaw? 
Yeah, no. So when we re-engage with the designers, um, really the two new pieces of information that we'll be giving them is these project uh, caps, um, but also that the design needs to be net zero. Um, and again, that will inform a lot of our a lot of our next steps once we get designs back. And then finally, uh, I just want to make sure I'm correct, and that is the Centennial Water Plant will be paid for from the funds for water, although the debt will count in our debt. So the the debt was included here um, for the analysis. Um, David, do you remember if you probably don't know, I'll have to double check. So there's inside the debt limit, outside the debt limit, and depending on what type of um, analysis you're looking at, it may or may not be included. So it is part of the town's debt, but because it has a dedicated funding source being the, um, the water fees that the town pays, um, it's treated a little bit differently than our regular general fund debt. Um, so I'll have to circle back to just confirm whether that's inside our debt limit or outside. Or actually, Sonia, you, Sonia's here. She may know. Um, the if, I might, I might, I'll, if I might, with the indulgence of the chairs, uh, water debt is generally outside the debt okay. limit, the legal 5% debt limit usually. Uh, but the other consideration, as Sean pointed out, is that the uh, water and sewer debt is paid for from uh, water and sewer revenues respectively. And as long as, and from a credit point of view, as long as uh, the enterprises are fully self-supporting, the, uh, you know, the rating agency uh, would expect to uh, apply yeah. to uh, S&P Global Ratings, but uh, S&P Global Ratings would not count um, enterprise debt towards the uh, debt score in the uh, credit rating of, of the town. So for what, uh, so those two issues. Yeah, go ahead. And um, the, the council orders for the borrowing were flexible. They had, they were within section seven or eight. So whichever worked out with the financial advisor, we would go either inside or outside. Okay. So they were flexible. Okay. And, and before I pass my time off, I just want to thank Sean and Paul and Sonia for just the outstanding work. And David, thank you for being there for the town as they work through this. This is, to me, always been quite an amazing model, and it's even better. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, Jane Scheffler. Uh, hi. Um, apologies ahead of time. I, if I, uh, if you hear baby screams, uh, my five-month-old is a little grumpy. Um, so, I the question I have is about the school and with the crop two or two and a half. Um, with having to have people vote on it, when when would it be presented to voters? Um, and then when would the, the tax increase uh, begin if it was passed? I guess that's the first question I have. So the, the when, I, so last time around, it was near the end of the feasibility study phase. Um, so I will have to circle back to you on the exact timing of that because the MSBA change their process a little bit from the first time around. Um, in terms of when the impact would be, this model has the impact beginning in FY25. Um, so, so the impact would be in the years that we have to make the, the debt payments on that, um, on that project. And so, and just one thing I'll add to this, this includes um, the debt exclusion would cover both the long-term principal and interest payments, but it also covers the, the short-term interest payments while the, uh, the construction project is going on, um, which would likely be through a bond anticipation note of some sort. Um, and again, the, the, that short-term interest will also be part of the debt exclusion. So the first payment um, I, this model has it would be FY25. Uh, and I just, it, it'd be nice if we all had a mute button for a cranky baby. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> uh, um, I, I guess the one additional thing that I'd say on having been on the select board when we did the last uh, override for school, uh, that's a decision that the council at the time the, the decision is made will have to consider all uh, um, factors 
because one of the things to we consider is when there's going to be an election that is scheduled and whether we're looking for an election with the highest potential level of citizen participation uh, so that the last override was intentionally uh, scheduled to fall within the November general election date. Uh, and we went through a process in order to get permission to do that. But uh, there was some um, effort made on the part of the select board uh, to strategically choose the date. Uh, Jane, I, I can uh, call in Alyssa and then come back to you if you'd prefer. Uh, you can just give me a thumbs up or thumbs down if you want me, or do you, want to, do you have another question now you can ask? Um, I think that helps answer both the questions I had because the other question I had is a little bit more in the weeds than we probably need to get at this point. <laughs> so I'm good. Okay, if you need another question to raise your hand again, but I'll um, call it, ask Alyssa next, recognizing Alyssa next. And um, since she was the other member of the select board who was uh, involved in that decision, I referred to if she has anything additional to, to say on that subject, she can do so. But Alyssa. Yeah, Andy, that's actually a really great segue because so many of the questions that were raised today are going to be terrific parts of an FAQ in terms of the outreach, because that's been one of the things that's been really hard for people to get their heads around is like, you say these things, but what do they mean in practical terms? When will we start seeing ribbons? When will we start seeing it hit our debt service, et cetera? So that's incredibly valuable. And as Andy says, it is a complex decision to decide what to do associated with an override. And I could speak at you for hours about um, how we came to those conclusions and the people who disagreed with us at the time. The thing I want to talk a little bit about here is a reminder for us to tell this story everywhere we go as this continues to fold, unfold is that it's not just you know a couple of specific points of outreach. It's something we talk about all the time because again, I bring <laughs> the old history of you know 99 to the present and we saw the town manager goal at the beginning of this presentation. That was a town manager goal back in 2012, 13, 14, 15, because we knew it had been a long time since we did the police station. We knew we had upcoming needs. Um, as Lynn points out, she's been on a couple different iterations of things associated with the fire station and DPW. We knew the schools, we knew the library. We've known all this for a really long time. And we asked for this same information we're getting today numerous times in history and they were derailed for various reasons but partially the most recent derailment I would argue was associated with the loss of the school's project in that the taxpayers voted to increase their taxes for that project but representative town meeting chose not to follow the will of the voters and at that point other than the schools continuing to put in statements of interest and trying to get back in the process and the library trying to get in the process and people continuing to talk about dpw and fire station there was not a laser-like focus on bringing these four projects forward on a continuing basis what i'm hearing today is that there seems to be a change that way there now seems to be a focus on this and so I really want to encourage all the town councilors as well as all the staff to continue to make this a focus of all kinds of conversations and newsletters. So when the next thing about things comes up, we all do that because the public outreach didn't really get off the ground except associated with each of the four projects. Absolutely, there was tons of public outreach, but in terms of the overall, we can do this. And the reality is we have to do this we have no choice. We have to address all four of these projects, even though it unfortunately means we aren't going to be able to put money in sidewalks the way we should have 50 years ago. But the reality is these four projects are in front of us right now for a good reason, because they were put off for decades and we do have to deal with them as they're here. So we don't have a choice. It's a matter of how effectively we do it to be as cost conscious as possible as we do it but there's not another opportunity to just fail to do it as we've done in the past. Thank you, Alyssa. Um, 
Shalini. Um, hi. Uh, so what can we tell uh, our District 5 people about Crocker Farm? Uh, like the current capital improvements? Are they, is it part of this plan? And what information can we share with them? So there are, I mean, so again, I mentioned earlier, there's sort of a connection between this model and the capital improvement program. And so the capital improvement program that will be discussed on Thursday night does have some uh, elements of the Crocker Farm repairs on there. For example, you'll see like the, the roof replacement out five mm -hmm. years and, and some HVAC improvements. Um, some of the other uh, costs that were identified in that study, we've identified in the capital improvement program. They're not slotted anywhere yet in any particular year because I, I don't think we're at that point yet. Um, I think there's still decisions to be made um, as part of the MSBA process about what happens, um, but we are trying to keep them on the radar, not lose sight mm -hmm. of, of those potential costs. Great, thank you. Okay, Mandy. Yeah, um, two questions for now. Um, but I guess one of them kind of relates to more than just one project. The first one is earlier in this meeting, someone mentioned a 5% debt limit. Um, I assume that's for the whole town, but I, one of the slides said that if we did this, we would increase a percentage of the general fund debt to seven or 8% and the EQV to 3%. So I'm guess I, my question is, what is that 5% debt limit mean? What is it based off of? And does this plan comport with that? Um, and the second one is, just, just to confirm, so we've had some preliminary cost estimates for a repair only of the library um, that ran from anywhere, I think if my memory is searching right, 14 to 17 million. And so if the MBLC project is not approved by this council, this plan would still fund, well, would, would still have that 15.8 limit on all of those repairs only that need done with the library, right? Um, I guess that's my question and so you know, that, that limit is there, whether it's the MBLC project or having to just repair those HVACs and carpets and everything else in that. Uh, those are my two questions for now. Yeah, so the, again, we'll go in reverse order. So the repair only um, option for the library. I think you can sort of look at it that way because the, the numbers coincidentally are sort of in the same ballpark. Um, we do, you know, Kuhn Riddle did put together sort of a, a draft timeline for how those repairs would be undertaken, uh, but it would still be up to the town to decide, you know, how those repairs actually are undertaken in the future. Um, but as sort of overall costs to get the sense of the magnitude, you can kind of look at it that way. Um, and then I'll look to David. I know that the 5% uh, cap, uh, upper limit. Um, it's not the, it's not what you would compare to that percentage that I gave you. That's a different percentage or a different metric, but maybe David can speak a little more to what that, um, that upper limit is. If I might through the chairs. Uh, yes. 5% uh, of EQV is the limit on indebtedness that can be authorized within the debt limit under section seven of chapter 44. Uh, as I mentioned before, water debt is generally outside the debt limit. Also, MSBA uh, funded projects are also outside the debt limit. So of the three projects, the, it would be just the library, DPW, and fire station that would be subject to that 5% debt limit. And I think that, that uh, Sean's projection was that, uh, and I think his projection included both enterprise, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, regional school debt, uh, it was a 3% of EQV. So you're, and, the, and the regional school debt from a legal point of view does not count uh, towards that debt limit. So uh, I think uh, this from a legal point of view, and it is a legal uh, distinction, um, uh, this plan will work, uh, be con uh, compliant with the 5% debt limit. I may have a follow-up question to you, David, uh, just on the same subject. The uh, borrowings that we're having to that we're doing for Community Preservation Act um, proposals, where the repayment is from future um, Community Preservation Act funds, is that part of the debt limit or not? It is. It would be. It would be considered part of the debt limit. Okay. Thank you. And that, and that was also included in the numbers that you 
um, saw or the, the current outstanding debt related to CPA was included in those numbers. Okay. And Pat. A uh, um, naive question or two. Um, the we sending out an RFP about property for the DPW. Uh, where is the cost of purchasing property uh, placed in all of this? And if we move um, the sixth grade, I think I know the answer to the second one. If we move the sixth grade uh, to the middle school, does that still remain as part of the elementary budget, or are we moving them into the regional budget? So the first question on the DPW, that would have to be part of that um, budget for that project, okay. uh, the, the cost you. of the land. Um, and the second piece, I th so my understanding at this time is that if they move to the middle school, it would still continue to be part of the elementary budget. Um, the only way that would change is if there was some movement to change the regional agreement to um, include. include sixth graders, but that would be a much bigger undertaking. Um, so, so they would be housed at the middle school, but they would still be treated like elementary school students from a cost perspective. Thank you. And uh, anything that would be negotiate uh, have to be done in renovations or modifications to the middle school would be a negotiated question between the town and the region, I assume. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm just going to clarify that too. Are there any other questions from members of the council or the finance committee, uh, resident members, uh, looking for any additional raised hands? Because if not, um, let's see, Kathy, I'll come back to you in a second. We are going to then turn to public comment. And I know there's at least one person in the public who's uh, asked to be recognized for public comment. So, Kathy? Lynn asked a question I forgot to ask. Um, the numbers you had for DPW and fire were a lot lower than numbers we've seen before. So what I wanted to know is, do you have any basis from looking outside the town of Amherst to think we can do, you know, as Paul, as you said, you know, we're not gonna get everything we want, but do we think we can get most of what we want in terms of the ambulances and the fire engines would fit in the building. Um, do we have any basis for thinking those are real numbers or were they, they certainly make the model work better mm -hmm. um, than the big numbers did. So I'm just wondering if we have some outside more information than we had before. Yeah, so so again, it's a, those numbers were a combination of one looking at um, some other towns and what they've been doing and, and what the cost of those projects are. Um, and then also what the model can support. So, so the, we, but we have looked at neighboring communities or other communities in Massachusetts as to what those projects would cost. I'll say that the sort of two wild cards are the net zero by law um, and what impact that could have on the cost. And then also cost escalation of the projects being in the future, what pricing will look like um, and what, what that increase will be. So again, I, I really think that we'll find out a lot more once we work with our designers um, to see, you know, here's what we want, here, here's our number, here's what we'd like, and then we can find out what we can actually get um, and then we can revisit it. Okay. So seeing nothing more uh, in questions from the Council of the Finance Committee, I am gonna to turn to public comment. I wanna remind uh, the public that they can, um, if they're uh, watching this on the uh, Zoom recording that they can uh, raise their hand, use the raise hand function. Um, anybody who's participating by telephone can press star nine on their telephone and then they'll be recognized. Uh, this is a period for public comment. We didn't label it as public questions. And I pointed that out earlier, but if your comment is along the lines of, this is additional information that would be helpful to have, I encourage that kind of public comment anyway. Uh, it's uh, really a discretionary question for Sean and Paul as to what they will respond to today. But um, information that the uh, public wants to, um, answers to, 
certainly uh, we want to know so that we can build it into future presentations. So with that, uh, Richard Morse is the first person who's uh, asked to comment. And uh, so I asked Athena to uh, bring uh, Mr. Morse in so that uh, he can identify himself and where he lives and um, offer his comment. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Uh, Richard Morse, uh, Mount Holyoke Drive. And I hope I'm within the guidelines that you set out, Andy. Um, my comment is in the form of a plea and a promise. And um, I think there's a fair amount of fear out there about our ability to take on these uh, projects. And I think the fear is being promoted in various places in town. But um, you have an intellectual challenge uh, to, my, to my counselors. You have an intellectual challenge in front of you. Now, I was in town meeting for 15 out of the last 20 years. And, you know, we were in there and it was assumed that we all had a Mangano-like command of the finances of the town. And it's clear that we did not. And now at this point, and I, once again, I'm emphasizing the intellectual challenge here. I do not assume that all 13 town councilors have a Mangano-like command of the town finances. But I'm asking you, I'm, this is my plea, that before you make hugely consequential uh, votes in town council, as I think you will in the library this spring, that you do your best to get a command of the finances of the town. Um, and that, and so my promise that goes with my plea is that there will be no such thing as a dumb question, <clears throat> a dumb question from town councilors. I, I heard Ms. DeAngelis being humble today. I, I'm, I'm, I'm asking you to ask all the questions that you need to ask, either in private or in public, to get a command of this uh, plan. It's not, <clears throat> it's not easy. So, so um, I'm asking, I, I do not assume, and I don't think anyone should, that every town council member has a full command of, of, these, of, of these finances. What other towns do, um, what the numbers are here, what all the considerations are. But I'm asking you to, find, to figure it out, work your way through it before you vote, uh, before you start making big consequential votes later this spring. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so the next person is Tony Cunningham. Uh, okay, hey. Tony, uh, hi. I want to uh, identify yourself and where you live and then. Yeah, yeah. My, na my name is Tony Cunningham. I live on Owen Drive. And firstly, I want to say hallelujah to assigning budget caps from the outset. I think this is something that has been missing in the past. And I think this is great that you're talking about assigning um, more conservative estimates for each of the projects. Um, referring back to Kathy Shane's question about the library project and what happens if the cost goes above the built-in contingency, um, the estimate I've been seeing for the library project is the same one we saw in 2016. It hasn't had any escalation added, despite the fact that that estimate was based on a construction starting in the summer of 2019. So I'm not sure if that number is still solid. And if it is, maybe you could help explain why it hasn't gone up with cost escalation. Um, and what is the plan if it goes above that 15.8? Where does the money come from? Um, whether it's because they don't fundraise uh, sufficient, sufficiently or the costs go up. Um, also for the library project, um, are CPA funds being counted as part of that town cost? And so would that number go down to 14.8 uh, for the 1 million that's been allocated in CPA to the library? Um, and then somebody mentioned the enterprise funds, which recently had more than $18 million in new debt authorized. Um, at the projected rates for water and sewer bills for FY25, uh, I did the calculation and it looks like uh, the average bill is gonna go up more than $300. And that's more than the debt, than the increase due to the school override. So just to make sure the public is aware yeah, you'll be, you know, advertising the impact to property tax bills of a school 
um, override, but also make them aware that there's other capital projects that will increase. Um, all, you know, I know it's not it's not coming out of property taxes; it's coming out of sewer and water bill. But three over three hundred is three hundred and twelve dollars more. I worked out, which is a lot for the average household. Um, and then lastly, I just make a, a call for um, a forward-looking approach. I, I didn't appreciate the comments made about the last school building project. It was a very divisive time, and I don't think it helps to um, cast blame at this point. I, I think we could all cast blame as to what went on then, but it's in the past, and uh, I'd appreciate if everybody looked forward uh, to the project that's hopefully going to unite the town. Thank you so much. Andy, can I respond to a couple points? Um, yes. I, um, just two of the quick ones. Um, uh, for the what's in that 15.8 million number for the library, that it does not include the CPA portion. So that would be that's part of the the six million or so that the library is coming up with separately. Um, it is we are considering it a local share in terms of how we're um, tracking it, but it, it's separate from that 15.8 million. Um, and then in terms of the cost itself for the project, um, I do know that they have been updating that total number um, for the cost of the library project. So that has been updated recently. And a lot of the, the questions are, there'll be more information shared on a lot of those questions that were just asked on Monday um, at the library specific presentation. We'll talk about, um, um, just the project itself and where it's at. Uh, Lynn has additional information in response. Uh, just a, a note on the CPA funds. The town council has the recommendation from the CPA committee, but we have not decided whether we're going to fund it, number one, and we have not had the discussion as to which side of the ledger it goes on, whether it's towards the town debt or the library fundraising. Okay. okay, so uh, anything else at this point? I appreciate all of the comments, so thank you. Uh, Carol Lewis. Hi, I'm Carol Lewis at uh, Ward Street in Amherst, and I'm hoping that the gentleman who spoke before and said stupid questions are okay. He didn't say it quite that way, but I hope that that applies to the public and not just the town council, because I just have two questions trying to understand what in the world I've just heard. And one of them is, it seems to me that uh, um, debt exclusion is functionally the same thing as the need for a tax override. And so my question is just, is that true? And the other one is the presentation seemed to suggest that if we keep 10 or 10 and a half percent as the capital percentage, but what if that goes down? And my question is, what makes it go up or down? Thank you. Do you mind, Andy, if I yeah. tackle Go those? Um, so the first one, uh, the difference between a debt exclusion and a, a tax override, um, they're similar, but the, the, the big difference is with the debt override, that only um, lasts as long as the debt lasts. So as the debt is paid off, that, that goes away, um, whereas a tax override sort of lives on. Um, so again, that's the, the debt exclusion is specifically just for the debt for, for this project. And then the second question about what makes the, the percentage of the levy go. Um, so ultimately it's you know, what the council um, approves, what the town manager puts forward in his budget. Um, you know, what could make it go down could be, you know, if there's economic troubles in the future, um, there could be decisions made around that, but ultimately the, the percentage is what's approved by the town council um, and put forward by the town manager. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Tim Neal. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, J just a quick question. Is that PowerPoint presentation gonna be available to the public? Yes, it's in the packet. Oh, sorry, jumped right into yeah. that. Sorry, Andy. <laughs> Go ahead, jump in. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, it's in the packet now, so it's available uh, online. You and will, I, will, okay. I will put it on the project page as well. Once that project page goes live at the end of the week, we'll put a link to it there as well. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up because for other members of the public, I should have said that earlier. Um, but uh, 
if you go to the council page on the um, town website and then where it says uh, committees and then go to the finance committee, you'll find meeting packets. And in the meeting packet for today's meeting, you will find the presentation so that it is available. Um, seeing nothing further from the public, I um, appreciate the public comment that we've received. It is noted uh, the uh, anything that hasn't been specifically responded to has certainly been noted. And I think we actually Sean has pretty much responded to most of the questions, if not all. Um, I um, will turn it back for just a moment to see if there are any other counselors who um, who have questions right now, or to make um, because what we're going to um, then do is. Uh, um, our, the finance committee will continue to meet after this um, joint meeting concludes. So the, the joint meeting will conclude at Lynn's discretion as council president. And uh, the uh, agenda uh, for the remainder of the finance committee meeting will be planning for um, what our uh, meeting schedule and work plan is for um, the next months ahead. Uh, and that it was part of the posted agenda for the finance committee meeting for today. Um, so I'm looking to see if there are any other comments and if not, I'd turn it to Lynn because I know she wants to say something. Lynn, you need to unmute. Thank you. I, I wanna emphasize something that Richard Moore said and that is there are no stupid questions this is a very, very complicated set of issues. And I think counselors will be asking lots and lots of questions. And we want to hear all of the stupid questions you think you may have. They are not stupid. They are necessary for you as counselors, for us as counselors, and for the public to understand this. And um, so please just continue to ask lots of questions. So, well, thank you, Pat. I just wanted to say, I never said stupid. <laughs> I said naive, <laughs> and I'm gonna encourage Mr. Morris and everyone else to use naive. <laughs> Kathy, before we uh, adjourn as a larger yeah, meeting. I, I underscore what Lynn said, and I also thought the, um, challenge that was issued to us to really understand these when I asked about the operating budgets this is not a small decision so just um, Sean has made it work by saying let's assume we can hold it to one and a half percent one to one and a half percent for another year um, and then you said maybe a few more years I think we need as soon as we can knowing that projecting all of this is ex extremely difficult um, particularly in the we don't know whether the town will be reopening soon. You know, who knows whether 65 year olds will ever get vaccinated so we can leave our homes again and eat out in restaurants. <laughs> They're eating in New York. They're just not eating here. But, but I think those are the kinds of, these aren't nuances. They are, these are major decisions we're making. And the question about sidewalks, um, if you look at our spending, on roads and sidewalks and say, what if we only had 2.8 million? You know, what's left for other things? This is tough. Um, this is a very tough uh, diet that we would be put on for a few years. I mean, you can see when we get under. So I think we all need to be looking at those interactions. Um, and uh, Sean admitted that DPW and fire was both looking outside the town, but also these numbers make this work. Um, we need to know these are real numbers at some point so that we can say this could work. You know, so I think it is a challenge to us because there's a lot of moving parts to make this work. And I really appreciate that you in these slides had these cautionary words, cautionary words, you know, like uh, don't, don't think we've, we've you know, uh, done it. Um, so I really think it was uh, very well done and we've got homework. Thank you, Sean. Um, this was just to offer up if, if anybody, if you want a quick, really, you know, quick two minute 
overview of the tool, I can pull it up for people if they want to see it really quickly. What's what's going to be available to the public on Friday? Um, nobody asked for it, which I was surprised and somewhat relieved. But uh, <laughs> if uh, if anybody does want that, I have it ready to do a quick overview. Okay, I'll uh, <laughs> look for uh, um, anybody from the council who raises their hands and asks will know. Uh, but thank you for the offer. Uh, Dorothy, your hand was up before Sean said that though, so you just... Well, I think that when, if listening to everything that's said and said today, that we realize that we've come to a point where we actually have to make the plans to do these projects. And the only thing that will see us through besides the fact that we have come to have great confidence in our financial team um, and that we are actually counting that what they tell us is true and we will believe them, okay, is that the, the thing that you mentioned, the caps on the costs, that we are going to have to spend our time really looking at what the plans are, what the costs are, that we're going to have to go forward, but go forward in a very prudent manner. And because I think it's terrible that some projects have been on the back burner for 25 years. Okay. And I, I think that we really just don't want that on our conscience that we didn't help these things go forward when they had to go, but it has to be very streamlined and we all have to cooperate um, on keeping the costs down. Thank you. That's actually a good segue to what I was going to say. I have not made comments myself throughout the entire discussion. And you get to exactly the point that I was going to raise. Um, we've made some deliberate decisions along the way in recent years to not do um, significant renovation type repairs um, at any of the buildings that we're talking about because we didn't know what the future plans would be and we were not wanting to spend money to make a correction to a building that would not that would not have a long lifespan unless it was necessary to do so um and that was a you know a strategic planning decision and it probably helped us get by these last few years in other ways but uh, a decision um uh, to not spend money on these buildings is no longer an option. And I think that's what the council has recognized. And that's part of the message we wanna put forward. Um, so with that, um, I turn this uh, over to um, President Griesmer and then uh, uh, she um, has the discussion to conclude the uh, council portion of the meeting, the finance committee, as I said, will continue to meet for a few minutes because we have to talk about the uh, meeting plan for um, the next months to take us through May, uh, at least. So with Lynn? that, uh, I wanna thank all of the counselors that joined us. Uh, we were a total of 11 today and uh, the overall council meeting is adjourned. Okay, so, thank you. Uh, members of the Finance Committee, um, I hope that you got my prior email uh, that I sent late this morning. Um, Lynn is going to be in a moment be putting it on the screen. Uh, and uh, what, it, uh, what we wanna do, what I wanted to do in this is make a suggestion of what we might want to attend to on the dates that we talked about. We said we would meet on the first and third uh, Tuesday of each month um, through the next couple of months and actually have that as our permanent schedule of uh, knowing that we had to add May as additional dates so that there are two purposes. One is I wanted to get comments on this um, and whether there are changes that people would like to propose, either additions, deletions, or frankly, just movements of dates. Um, and one of the questions that had come up in today's meeting is that Sean's uh, presentation pointed out that I think the second public forum would be on March 8th, if I recall correctly. 
And uh, so should the Jones Library be moved to the 16th, for example? I guess just throw out one that I had thought about. Uh, so, uh, Lynn. Um, my, yeah, uh, I was actually gonna raise that. I, I would very much appreciate that the finance committee be a, a big ear for those additional questions that are particularly related to finance as it relates to the library. I do not want us to just start sending off, you know, a question here and a question there to the library, but to consolidate them. And uh, we will start on the 22nd with their presentation. And in fact, I understand that we're going to be receiving that tomorrow. Um, and, and also uh, on the third and the, now, you, now I've got my dates wrong. There are two meetings coming, two, uh, two public forums coming up on the library where I hope we will hear from lots of the public and that would mean that moving the Jones Library piece to the 16th, although we could start it on the 2nd and then add to it on the 16th of March. So, uh, Kathy, for... I'm just, unmute. I'm just unmuting. Um, um, I think that suggestion that Lynn just made makes a lot of sense. And I would suggest that we put it both on the 16th and on April 6th, um, Jones in two places. And my reasoning for that is if we um, generate a set of questions in the finance discussion as we gather them, they may not have all the answers at the first meeting. And so we can give a coherent set and have them come back again. Um, because um, it may require some additional analysis or information that's not at our hand. It's a, it's a big enough financial decision. I think we should um, allow more time to it. So that was just a suggestion of putting it in two places. And, and one of the, um, uh, right now on March 16th, you have alternative ways of setting water and sewer rates. Uh, Bernie and I did send through a, a memo and it, it, it went, you know, I made a mistake and sent it directly to Guilford, but Paul has it, but we have not yet had a discussion with Guilford. So what I don't know, Andy, whether um, what we suggested in ours as a way of looking at alternative, whether he will say good start, but here are some other ways you might wanna do it. So we haven't had that conversation. So I don't know whether it will be ready by March 16th, given that we haven't connected with him yet. So it's just a, the March 16th alternative ways might move to a later date. And I don't know which, you know, what date, it's just pending. I mean, Paul Paul knows that request is in and I'm sure there are other things on Guilford's desk. Um, so uh, I didn't, I, I think we need to be ready for that. Everyone saw the memo on what we were thinking about doing, but there's uh, what the hope would be is some what if kinds of analysis to see whether we, want to go down this road. It wasn't a decision making, it was an informing us on consequences if we made certain decisions. That's it. So we need to come to that, back to that in a second. Uh, there's, there's two things that are out there now. One is uh, where to place the Jones Library with the suggestion also that we add it on two, we have it on two different dates and um, the other uh, that you just brought up, which is a question of uh, not analysis of alternative ways of setting water and sewer rates, whether that can stand the 16th or needs to be pushed back. <clears throat> the um, OPEB actuary report is a fairly um, meaty subject, if you will. Uh, having gone through these presentations before where the actuary explains what the current projections are for OPEB costs and the financial consequences of that. So that that's going to be a fairly major piece. And I was trying to only add one additional thing to that meeting. Um, and that is um, already scheduled. So I wanted to make you aware of that. 
Um, on March 2nd, the two proposed financial orders will not be complex orders. They're sort of housekeeping things to uh, make sure where there needs to be approval of uh, things that just are routine in the course of business that happen from time to time. Uh, so I don't think those will be uh, very difficult. One of the other things I just wanted to point out, and then we'll get back to trying to settle those questions, is that the Climate Action Adaptation Resilience Plan budget recommendations, we got a taste of that um, in a presentation made at the last council meeting. And uh, so there is some ability to, have, to start having some discussions and approaching uh, the uh, Climate Action Committee uh, to uh, ECAC to, to, to begin that conversation. Um, but um, it, they are talking about um, things that are starting within the next fiscal year. And uh, um, I did make the comment at the council meeting about where we are in the budget process for the next fiscal year and the complexity of that. Uh, the uh, actual plan itself um, is not due until uh, May 1st, I believe. And uh, the problem then is we will be uh, in that monthly crunch period when we receive it. So we either uh, have to deal with it in April or June, but dealing with it in May is not a realistic thing to propose. So I just wanted to point those out. Lynn, thoughts? Uh, yeah, I thank you for um, pointing that one out. Uh, I actually would suggest we start formulating questions on March 2nd and try to have them totally completed in an exchange with the library on March 16th. Uh, they, I'm sure, I know they will be very present at the um, public forums as well. The other thing is we only have two meetings in April uh, for the council. And unless we schedule another one at the very end of April. So I'm trying to stick to that idea. And of course, the other is that the regional school budget will be voted and presented okay. in the cycle that has to do with uh, town meetings in the other three towns and town meetings in the other three towns happen um, in late April, early May. And that is why our charter um, has a provision that allows us to consider uh, that budget separately and uh, why we need to uh, um, list it as an April item. Um, is there general agreement to uh, have the library listed on March 2nd and March 16th? It seems to be so, you're gonna add that. You know, and yes, I think so, Andy. And, and my only, I know Lynn is pushing for decisions in April or the library is, but um, if we can't get some questions answered, I think we have to do a report that actually has vetted the kinds of information we're getting. So I think it's fine to put it in two places, but you've just said March 16th will be a full agenda. I just think we, we're going to have to write a report and we I'm hoping that we will be able to be pretty thorough in getting questions and answers. So, so yes, for twice in those times, but we might need time on the 16th is all I'm saying. If you feel like it's pretty crunched. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if uh, Sean's experience is any different, but I would think that the OPEB report, could take as much, almost as much time as today's presentation took. Um, I hope not. Um, it, it sort of depends on what what you all want. Um, so, I, so a good example is the audit presentation that we just had this year. The audit presentation was relatively brief, and you know we touched on the questions and and you know this is a. I haven't seen what a presentation looks like from our new OPEB actuary. Um, 
so it depends on what the what the finance committee wants um, in terms of how long the presentation will be. Yeah, uh, having that since you haven't been through it before, uh, there's a lot of uh, what I would say is complex legal and financial aspects to it in addition to the actual projections made by the actuary. And uh, in order to get a prior, we've had previously we had a separate actuary and he would try and explain a little bit of how the uh, OPEB obligation is structured. Uh, and I think that the, the difficulty is uh, just the complexity of information on the subject that we really have not dealt with in the depth that we will likely get it presented to us. Um, but I can't, uh, other than that, make a real projection. Uh, so we're back to the, in, on the, I don't have anything else right now for April 20th and uh, we could move the um, stormwater, uh, not the stormwater, the, uh, uh, the one that is just highlighted the alternative sewer water rates to April 20th. And um, if we uh, wanted to do so, because I think that uh, that would fit there too. Kathy, I assume, do you think that's the better choice to give it a little extra time? Yes. Okay, so we did that. Thank you. That's his hand up and so does Bernie. Okay, Bernie, I didn't, I lost that's, my- brief. No, that's right. I think uh, I just, I'll, I'll agree with Kathy. I think it's, it's best to move that. I was just looking at, you know, which of these topics are more pressing. Uh, if you've got, the actuary actually scheduled to come in on March 16th and we need to honor that date. But um, I would almost think that the OPEB, some of the OPEB discussion could uh, could be deferred. But if you got somebody coming in and that, that's, that's it. Yeah, um, as you know, I think uh, communities are required to have uh, actuary assessments of their OPEB obligation every other year. And mm -hmm. this is the cycle that we're on so that the report is coming and that's when we have our expert. So that's why uh, they're scheduled as it was and we were trying to avoid the month we're in because we knew this month was, uh, we had already filled both meetings. Um, let me go back to the participant list for just a second. I don't see any other hands up. So I think that the other issue that we want to talk about, um, if we agree with this proposal, we can uh, adopt it in a moment. But the other, um, I'm assuming that we're staying with first and third is uh, Tuesdays is our regular meeting date and just adding May dates and um, we can either try and do that today or I can make have another suggestion. And that is that the major problem that um, I think that we, that we have with scheduling is conflicts with other meetings. Um, I know that, uh, for example, that um, people who are on CRC have um, some meetings that they have in conjunction with the planning board uh, or it's a uh, uh, zoning bylaw committee. And uh, so if there's a desire to uh, consult with other committees and come back, we can add our May dates on the March 2nd meeting, but I think we need to make a decision so that everybody gets it on their calendar. Um, and if people, if there's some comfort in adding May dates, then let's talk about it right now. 
Indy, if you would like, Dana could help poll people for May dates beyond the given two dates. Because last year, I believe we were meeting twice a week. Um, last two years, we've met twice a week during May. We did meet twice a week during May, and I think that we did it for possibly three Thursdays in addition to the, and, and we did it every Tuesday. Yeah. And, and, the, and I think that the problems that we've got in your suggestion of uh, uh, doing something uh, in the way of uh, like a doodle poll is probably a good one. Uh, CRC has its as its regular meeting date, uh, the second and fourth Tuesdays, which is how we came to the first and third. And I think that they are planning, they're assuming that that holds for May so that uh, we actually have problems in the, uh, with, with scheduling for meetings. Uh, Dorothy? Let me recognize you for a second and then we'll... Well, the, the plan, the schedule for CRC does in fact have a meeting on May 11th and on May 25th. And you're right that sometimes those meetings involve other people besides CRC. Um, so it's, it may be something that if we could consider it, that on those two, the, those two weeks that... Um, Perhaps finance could meet on the Thursday that we we always meet on the second, you know, we always meet on, this, on those Thursdays in May, but for the Tuesday meeting, meet at a different time or, um, I mean, on a different day. I mean, for example, if, if um, finance did not meet at two, but met at um, four or 4.30, does that conflict with other meetings? I mean, or maybe you could yeah. just talk with Mandy. I mean, that would be the easiest thing would be if you talked with Mandy and, and said, where is your flexibility or, or do I have to be the one of flexible? And she may in fact be able to be flexible. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. Um, though I did have obviously spoken with her and because uh, that's where I got the information that I've already conveyed. So why don't we do this? Um, John and I will consult as to the number of days that we think we need to schedule during May in order to get all of the presentations in. And we'll try and do that in the next day or two. And then uh, either ourselves or with Athena's, uh, through Athena, uh, create a poll and ask for um, res prompt responses to that. And I will also, uh, can make sure that Mandy's consulted if mm -hmm. we're doing anything that's infringing upon times when she's likely to uh, think that they, the CRC committee will meet. Does that sound like a reasonable yeah, proposal? Yeah, that sounds reasonable. Okay, so I, I will check with Sean and um, look for an email with a link for a poll. Um, sometime this week so that we can move this forward and then we'll try and do it as quickly as possible and even make a proposal before the next meeting to confirm at the next meeting. So anything else we need to talk about with scheduling? Seeing nothing on that. The one um, additional item that I wanted to uh, just recognizes that uh, this is uh, in the un unexpected business category. Um, it was said last week when the audit was being, uh, our last meeting when the audit was being presented, that there was one part of the audit that had to do with federal grants that um, mm -hmm. is now available and is a fairly straightforward section. And I think is actually put in the packet for the last meeting already. And uh, so I just wanted to alert you to 
the fact that if you go into the packet for the last meeting, um, that there should be an additional audit document that was added today. And uh, take a look at it. And if you feel that you would like to discuss it as an additional item at a finance committee meeting, um, let me know so that, or let Sean know so that we can get it scheduled. Um, may not be necessary. It's uh, not a complex portion of the audit as the last one was. Um, and uh, so, but it's a judgment that I think each of you needs to make. So we will add it to an agenda if you think that it's necessary. Sean, do you have anything else to add on that? No, I think it was um, as we had imagined, which was there were no um, issues with it. So it's sort of the same as it always is. Also been added, it will also be in the council packet for Monday along with the audit and the presentation so that people can look at it there too. So if any of you can't find it, what's, it, uh, what's the formal name on it? Just so that people know what to look for. Uh, um, uh, Sonia emailed it to us today. It's SAR20. Yeah. Amherst MASAR20 is the attachment. You sent it, send it to all members, to the resident members of the committee as well as the council members. So, yeah. Um, but Take just beware, she sent it twice. The first time was the full 73 page audit. So just take a look before you print. And what she sent today is 11 pages. Right. And it's also on the, um, the easiest way to find it for the public and just go to the accounting page. It's right there. So if you would, uh, it's everywhere. If you have problems finding the, um, that additional audit section, please let me know. Is there any other business that we didn't anticipate that I need to add? Because if not, then I think that uh, we can adjourn. So I guess one, one last question. Um, are two members of the public still present? If there's any additional public comment, uh, I'll give you about a minute to raise hands. If I don't see a raised hand coming, then I think that uh, we will um, treat today's meeting as uh, concluded. And I want to thank everybody. This was a very intense and meeting. And I particularly, Sean, want to uh, thank you for uh, your presentation. It was your presentation and your response to questions was really, really helpful. So thank you. Yeah. I big, second that. Thank it was, I understood every word of it, Sean. At least I felt like I did. So that was really great. And the, and as I said, I appreciated the caution charts a lot. <laughs> okay, so we've had no requests for additional public comments. So with that, um, I thank everybody and uh, we are adjourned. <laughs>